name is Catherine. Um, I am here with Kayla. I'll introduce myself and then I'll let her introduce herself. But um, yeah, I'm a student and worker at FSU. I'm also a member um, of the Teaching Support Staff Union, and where I'm also a shop steward and um, a member of the Social, sorry, Solidarity and Social Justice Committee of the TSU. Um, and yeah, I'll let Kayla introduce herself as well. Hey, I'm co MC with Catherine tonight. Uh, my name is Kayla. Uh, I'm also a member of the TSSU Teaching Support Staff Union. Um, I'm the chair. I'm also a steward. I'm also a student, a worker, uh, many things, and I'm just glad to welcome you here tonight. And I'll pass it off to Catherine. Yeah, thanks. I just turned the mic off. Okay. Um, thank you. Yeah, really glad to welcome you all here tonight as well. And um, so I'll just get started with um, a territorial acknowledgement. So. Um, this event takes place on the traditional, unceded, and occupied lands of the Soto, Squamish, and Musqueam nations. Um, and so building a better world, of course, includes the decolonial struggle towards land back. Um, and we at the Center for Socialist Education are in solidarity with the struggles of peoples of the territories we occupy, um, which includes the labor um, struggles that affect indigenous workers under the colonial system. Um, and so we have some great speakers tonight, um, some women across the labor movement who are here to honor and celebrate the victories and struggles of women fighting for better working conditions and better wages, equality for all genders, and better communities that can take care of all of our needs. Um, and there's free food and wine over there. Dave was kind enough to serve to us, so if ever, feel free to go up. Um, we're also collecting donations to recoup some of the costs. Um, this is totally optional. Um, you can give your donations over there, or we also take e-transfers. Um, the email is, I'm assuming, on a slide or something, but I can also just say it. And if ever you're curious what the email is, you can always come back and ask us. <laughs> but I can also say it now. It's adam.k.kirk, kirk with a k, at gmail.com. Okay. So, um, also, really quickly, before um, I start, I also want to highlight the like, COVID situation, obviously. Um, and so, also talk about like the precautions we put in place. Um, so, we tried to focus more on ventilation, just because um, we have food and drinks, so like people might not like, have their masks on, that's fine. But um, So, we have like air purifiers and some fans are going there, and I think there's like four in total. We're getting the door open. So trying to get like as much air circulation as possible, but of course, just be cautious of your like, comfort level, and if ever you have any concerns, you can come talk to us. Um, so with that said, um, before we introduce our speakers and get into their presentations, um, Kayla and I are gonna talk a little bit about the history of International Women's Day, um, as well as give some background about our union and talk about, so I'm just gonna get that off. Yeah, so we're going to introduce our union, give some background and some history about, um, yeah, like the feminist history of our union and how it operates according to feminist principles today. Um, so International Women's Day, which was Tuesday, calls for a celebration of the history of women's struggle for rights and equality and the uprising of women in the labor movement. But it also calls for solidarity with a struggle towards an end to all forms of gender-based violence, which includes colonial violence on the land of indigenous women, as well as economic violence. Um, so economic violence that includes austerity and budget cuts, for example, to public services that increases work, work for women at home, um, while at the same time cutting wages and social safety nets for public sector care workers, many of whom are women, including the workers considered essential during a pandemic. So, grocery store clerks and hospital and workplace cleaners, just to name a few. Um, so a reminder of the history of International Women's Day is therefore important because it highlights that much of the roots of intersectional feminism lie in the labor movement. And a reminder of the history is also especially important in today's context of neoliberal white feminist messaging that dominates the popular understanding of International Women's Day today and sort of turns it into a celebration of womanhood from within capitalist and colonial structures. And so the creation of International Women's Day to give like just quick background, but I think Virginia's gonna talk a lot more about that, 
um, was inspired by the 1909 garment workers' strike, um, during which many immigrant women in their teens and early 20s um, organized an 11-week 11, 11 strike in New York City um, and won the recognition for International Ladies Garment Workers' Union. And in 1909, a socialist feminist named Clara Zetkin proposed that the world honor this strike with the International Working Women's Day. Um, and then also in 1912, garment workers in a textile factory in Lawrence, Massachusetts, many of whom, again, were immigrant women, successfully organized to fight for an increase in wages and for more decent um, living conditions. So this strike is sometimes referred to as the Bread and Roses strike, in reference to the importance that they place not only on the material compensation of work, and so an increase in wages or bread, um, but also dignity of the worker and humane working conditions um, that they fought for. So symbolized by roses. Um, so the roses on the tables and the food that we're serving tonight um, is just an honor and celebration of these women and the victories of, and struggles of women fighting for better working conditions and better wages in history today. So um, with this sort of historical context in mind, um, I want to move on to talk about our union, TSSU, um, so the Teaching Support Staff Union, and our history as a feminist union. And to tell the story, I'm relying really heavily on um, a really important article written by TSSU members um, Jay Poe that we have here, and he's going to speak later, um, and Ali Masi, who's also a TSSU member. Um, and the article is titled, With Working Women Unite, Exploring a Socialist Feminist non hierarchical People, Teachers Union, and the Brotherhood are Interested. Um, so TSSU began as part of the Umbrella um, Organization, Association of University and College Employees. Um, which itself stemmed from the women's liberation, anti-war, and free speech movements in the 1960s and 70s. But they were also involved um, in the socialist uh, feminist Vancouver's Women Caucus, who were fighting for the exclusion, fighting the exclusion of women within the union movement. And so TSSU founded a union composed of and for um, women workers that fought for equal pay for equal work, um, equal status for women workers, and um, a democratic structure and member-driven uh, decision-making. And so, as other unions of the AUCE, so the Association of um, University and College Employees, um, those unions were sort of began to be absolved, uh, absorbed by other bigger national unions um, throughout Canada, but um, TSSU had voted in 1978 to remain independent. Um, and so, we're still an independent union today, and the fact that we're still going strong and like the fact that we voted to be independent actually was sort of allowed us to remain non-hierarchical and directly democratic and also allowed us to um, stay committed to TSSU's socialist feminist um, foundation. And so yeah, it's a huge victory and we're still growing. We're around um, 3,000 members of all genders. Um, and yeah, to me it's just a huge victory um, over the increasingly sort of like capitalist-minded and neoliberal university. Um, so yeah, that concludes my section. We'll now pass it on to Kayla, who will talk a, lot, a little bit more about TSSU's work as a feminist union today. Thanks, Catherine. So thanks for that great context and history. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how our history as a feminist union is crucial for how we organize today. Um, so because of this history, um, our union embodies some of the best qualities of both grassroots movements and labor movements combined. So we have the best of both worlds, the openness of non-hierarchy that grassroots uh, groups have, but also the militancy and structure of a labor union. So within TSSU, we have member-driven committees that make decisions, they spend budgets, they hold events without oversight from the executive committee or any one leader. Instead, we're all accountable to the collective. Um, agendas are always open to new additions from members. Any new committee can be formed, and we always have open bargaining. So we very much value participation. In all, we resist hierarchies and secrecy that come from patriarchy, which demands constant ranking and stratification of all kinds, between genders, races, abilities, and ultimately classes. So it's with this lens that we're committed to organizing against the serious work at the neoliberal university. And most of our members have to reapply for their jobs every four months. So that's teaching assistants, research assistants, and sessionals. 
Uh, and for international student workers, the immigration status is tied to the university, so very precarious. Um, we know that women and gender oppressed people are impacted the most when it comes to, to precarious work, especially migrant and racialized women who face other kinds of structural oppression. If we don't have stable employment, how can we leave a violent or abusive household? How can we care for our families when we don't know if we will have a job in four months? How can we report harassment? How can we get politically involved to fight back against patriarchy if we're always looking for work? Being a union, of course, is very important here. We have strength in the collective. Uh, we can also fight to protect each other. But there's much more work to do. Our current fight is for a contract for our newly organized research assistants, where uh, over 900 of them signed cards to join the union uh, in 2019, when SFU voluntarily recognized them. That, um, that was, so that was three years ago when we did the card signing, and we're still fighting. We still don't have a contract. Um, and that's what this event is about. So we're still fighting. We're fighting for better working conditions and for our better communities, ultimately. Um, in terms of the current political situa situation for working class women and gender oppressed people, it's still a major struggle. Um, and I say gender oppressed people because International Women's Day is not just for women, not just for cis women, but for all non-binary siblings, trans women, cis women, and all gender diverse people who are oppressed by the capitalist patriarchy that devalues our lives and our labor. Gender diversity has always existed, and the emergence of class society, colonization, and imperialism has tried to erase that. Today, the right wing scaremongers against what they call gender ideology, and they aim to strictly enforce the gender binary and suppress our bodily autonomy. There's an un unmistakable link between the misogyny of the far right, their white supremacy, their anti-public health, anti-union, and anti-worker politics. Their movements are growing, as we saw with the growth of the People's Party and now the so-called trucker convoy that seems to have very few truckers involved. Um, they're, they're growing, but so are we. We have four amazing speakers here tonight who are going to talk about their collective fights against, uh, against this and uh, within the labor movement and how we're organizing against the bosses, against racism, against the far right, against outsourcing, against privatization, and much more. So first up, I'm really pleased to introduce our first speaker, who is Regina Mahdi here. Um, Regina is a high school teacher at West Vancouver. Um, she's active in the BCTF Committee for Action on Social Justice, Anti-Racism Action Group. She's been part of organizing the Action Caucus, a group committed to fighting for a left agenda within the Canadian Labour Congress. And she's a longtime anti-war activist and internationalist. She's also a member of the Communist Party of Canada. Take it away, Regine. Thank you, Kayla, for that introduction. And firstly, I just want to say I'm really happy to be amongst such um, militant labor activists here today, most of both of whom are women and others amongst you that are also women. I also want to give a shout out because as a teacher, I teach Social Justice 12 and Economic Theory 12 and Socials 8. And uh, my students, one of which is here today actually supporting this event, um, put on um, an International Women's Day event and all day, all uh, week, uh, they and others, part of their Student Union for Social Justice, were raising awareness about the importance of International Women's Day and um, they were raising money and they made almost $200 for a women's center. Um, and I think that's just so incredible that high school students were, you know, bringing these discussions into the classrooms and making it, um, making more students aware of how misogyny manifests itself today and the importance of celebrating International Women's Day. So I wanted to start off with that, um, just to, you know, say like the work that we do in the classroom is really important and, um, Changing people's mindset starts in the classroom. And I think in, on that note, the first thing that I want to bring up is when in regards to changing people's mindset. As a teacher, I often ask my students, particularly in economics when we're learning about topics like labor studies, what's the first image that comes to mind when you think of the working class? And oftentimes what they think is like white, masculine, male. And I'm here today for my presentation to completely debunk that and show the uh, the work that many women have done within the labor movement and to recognize that the labor movement is not just white, it's not just masculine. In fact, this city was built by Chinese laborers. It was built by indigenous laborers, you know? And the reason why we have International Women's Day is because women within the labor movement were the ones that advocated for a day of recognition for women, right? It wasn't right now Women's Day, and maybe we can, and Ryan, you can help me and go to the next slide. Um, Today, you know, we see the commercialization of International Women's Day. Um, 
you know, big, big forms of media are showing this as this event that they can commercialize on and, and glamorize and sell their products for. Um, but, you know, International Women's Day, as uh, Catherine was saying, has its roots in uh, labor history. Um, so, as many of you know, it's on March 8th, and it's celebrated every day around the um, world, and it was a focal point in the movement for women's rights. Um, and as it was said, the earliest was done by labor activists in the United States, one of which I'll talk about in just a minute on the next slide. Um, but there was many others, like Clara Zetkin, that were also involved in this labor struggle. So, Ryan, if you could go to the next one for me. So, Teresa Malkiel was an influential woman. Maybe you can go down and for all of the points. So she was Ukrainian-born American labor activist and suffragist and educator, and she was a garment factory worker uh, who joined the Socialist Party of America and became one of its leaders. Um, and it was there that she advocated for you know, better working conditions, particularly for women. So women faced a double burden, you know, one within the home being exploited for the majority of the household labor and the childbearing that they had to do. But it wasn't that they were only confined to the home. Within the workplace, because of their gender, they were devalued laborers. And oftentimes, this led to the hyper-exploitation of women who received uh, lower wages than other workers. And of course, this brought capitalists a lot of profit. Uh, next point. Um, and she wrote about her situation as a worker in her book, The Diary of a Shirtwaist Striker. Okay, and then, of course, Clara Zetkin, who is uh, one of the influential leaders who uh, brought uh, the importance of having uh, uh, International Women's Day recognized as a formal day uh, for women. And she was a German revolutionary and trade activist who played a role within the International Socialist and Trade Union Congress. Um, she was trained as a teacher, so I particularly connect to her because of her teaching background. Um, and a teacher at the College for Women, um, and she was within there involved in different labor activism. Um, so it was within uh, the socialist movement that she was really advocating for, um, you know, because she critiqued the feminist movement for not having necessarily a strong class analysis, right? The first wave feminism focused a lot on uh, the importance of women in terms of voting rights, and then within the socialist movement, um, you know, there wasn't as much emphasis about how women are oppressed and how it's important for the socialist movement to also talk about the emancipation of women. And she was also an anti-war activist, and at that time it was the First World War, and so to be uh, somebody, you know, particularly uh, the activists like Teresa, who was a socialist in the United States, to be talking against war also could have meant as an immigrant you'd be deported for an act like that. And we've seen that by other activists like Emma Goldman. Um, but, uh, you know, it was, uh, Clara Zetkin wasn't alone in bringing International Women's Day to the forefront of socialist struggles. Within the Second International, there are also other revolutionaries, primarily Russian revolutionaries like Alexander Kollontai, Vladimir Lenin, and others who recognize the importance of fighting for the liberation of women. And at that time, there were a lot of socialist parties that were hesitant to... Um, bring women's uh, agenda to the forefront of their political actions, but it was uh, through uh, this struggle that it led communists to recognize that we need to have a strong agenda for women's rights. And so in 1899, Lenin suggested adding the establishment of full equality of rights of men and women into the party program, and it within the Russian Communist Party, or the Social Democratic Party at the time, and at the Second Congress in 1903, this edition was officially added. And uh, Lenin, from there, demanded that the party recognize the right to maternity leave. And from this point, they started to recognize how women's emancipation was actually completely correlated to bettering their working conditions. I'm going to talk really briefly about different uh, cases in which women played very revolutionary roles within different labor struggles. And I'll start with the Russian Revolution. Um, so the first point is, year, uh, well, over 100 years ago now, on February 23rd, 1917, it was actually on International Women's Day that 50,000 women poured out of the factories and onto the streets, sparking the first revolution in Russia that ultimately changed the course of history and led to the downfall of the Tsar. So I, when I'm usually teaching history, I like to say that, you know, the Russian Revolution wasn't just about 
you know, the Lenins of the world, but it was the woman who stood up. It was the woman who first went out on the streets and demanded justice because Russia was in a phase of crisis after going through war. People didn't have enough to eat. There was famines. And so they made a basic demand for bread and peace. And from there, um, you know, a lot of actions were taking place. So essentially, this movement not only brought women together, but also masses of people who simply called for bread and peace. And the, but however, this wasn't just spontaneous. It didn't come out of nowhere. Women were organizing themselves and creating unions and getting to ready to fight militantly to alleviate their hardships way before the uh, 1917 revolution. So just to give you some background, by the late 19th century and early 20th century, many women were becoming factory workers or textile workers uh, specifically. Many of them found jobs in domestic services. So just to give you an idea, if you go to the next point, next couple points. Um, but between 1901 to 1913, the number of women working in factories had grown by 59%, whereas the number of men only increased by 29%. So this kind of challenges the notion that, oh, women were staying at home and, and child caring and taking care of their husbands while the men were out there doing the work. Actually, during the process of industrialization, it was a many women that were started to bring in be brought into the factory. And if you go to the next point, it was uh, Lenin's wife, Krupskaya, Nadia Krupskaya, who wrote an article called The Woman Worker. And it was in this article that she started talking about the conditions of women in Russia and using a Marxist analysis to understand why they were hyper-exploited. And at the time, the feminist movement wasn't necessarily applying that class analysis. Was it necessarily saying, OK, yes, we should be advocating for women's rights, but it's also through the process of socialism that we can alleviate some of the hardships that we face. And so from there, it was the, you know, the, the Russian communists at the time started to recognize that we need to be uh, bringing women workers into our movement. So in 1914, the Bolshevik newspaper for women workers called Robotsnitsa was created, and it was through here that they spread their literature about the conditions of women at the time. And then this followed with many, many labor strikes that occurred in early 1900s in Russia, which eventually led to worker Soviets, which is why after the Russian Revolution, it was called the Soviet Union. And it was Ivano workers that created the first uh, worker Soviets. And out of this working Soviets, they, uh, they nominated 25 women as representatives of the council, which is quite revolutionary at the time, considering that women were still seen as inferior. So to be electing women in positions of leadership within the labor movement in Russia was quite revolutionary. And um, yeah, so from there, um, actually 62% of these women belonged to the Bolshevik party, whereas the men in these positions of leadership were only consists of 15.6%. So of course, after the Re Russian revolu uh, revolution, there was lots of victories for working class women. And, uh, uh, I think it's really important for us to recognize some of the accomplishments of revolutionary women at the time, such as Alexandra Kollontai, who I mentioned earlier, Anissa Armand, Nadezhda Krupskaya. Um, there were some of the very many influential women in the, uh, in the Soviet Union. And as a result of their contributions to the labor movement, their contributions to uh, the Russian Revolution, where um, it was the first country to recognize equal status between husband and wife. Um, they, the Bolsheviks in 1918 created uh, a department for the protection of maternity and youth, and this department supported uh, pregnant working class women and new mothers by ensuring a 16 paid uh, uh, leave from work and setting firm safety regulations. Because one of the uh, issues that a lot of the women were talking about were things like sexual harassment happening in the workforce. So they brought this into action and started to make concrete changes. Another thing that the Soviet Union did was become the first country to legalize abortion. Uh, sex work was also decriminalized in 1922. There are also sexual education programs more available for youth where they also implemented clinics where they specifically treated uh, 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 youth and others in their community that had different STIs. So even, I'll talk a little bit later on, but even at my school, a lot of the students are saying right now that they're not getting proper sex education. Right? And the reason why I'm mentioning uh, these, uh, these points and these victories is because it's the contribution of women within the socialist movement, the contribution of women within the labor movement 
that led to some of these victories. And I hope that it's through the contribution of us today where we can see concrete changes going forward. The party also created this uh, organization called Vision Notedale, which specifically focused on uh, women's issues within the Soviet Union and bringing women in, uh, particularly increasing the literacy rates of women. So there are massive accomplishments in regards to women's rights in an era where women weren't even allowed to vote in many places in the world, or just allowed to vote, right? They weren't considered equal in terms of marriage. Uh, rape, I think, in marital rape, it wasn't until 1980s or 1990s that it was recognized in Canada, whereas it was this era that they set firm policies on this. Why? Because of the contribution of the socialist movement towards the emancipation of women. But this obviously wasn't just specific to Russia. A lot of this was also happening here in, uh, in Canada. So uh, I am part, as Kayla said, the Communist Party of Canada, and I'm part specifically of the Annie Buller Club. And uh, Annie Buller was a longtime uh, labor activist, and she was also the co-founder of the Communist Party of Canada, which is quite, quite revolutionary, because how many parties can you say whose co-founder was also a woman? Not very many, but ours was, and I think that's a, a, a history that's worth sharing. So Annie Buller was also actually a Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian born, and she was Jewish, of Jewish uh, ethnicity. Her father was a carpenter, and she immigrated to Montreal with her parents in the early 1900s. She became politically active in socialist po politics, similarly during the World War I era. And, her, uh, and she herself was a working class woman. So by the age of 13, Bully, uh, Buller was working in a tobacco factory. She worked 12 hours a day, six days a week. And by the age of 16, she became a clerk in a five and dime store. And then by the age of 17, she had a, do a job in Almy department store. Throughout the 1920s, Buller worked as a union organizer and traveled extensively throughout Canada, organizing needle trades and supporting miners and steel workers. She was, played a big role in the 1931 Estefan coal miners strike. I actually had a student of mine whose great great grandfather was involved in the strike. And if uh, any of you know about this strike, it was a bloody battle between the RCMP and the miners. And it was her grandfather that was shot in the back by the RCMP. But it was Annie Buller that played a leader, took a leadership role in this mine, in this strike. So I think that that's quite important of our history and also shows again that women have played a big role within the labor movement and that we shouldn't erase that history. The same thing during that era was going on in uh, the United States. So I call, I call this, if you, any of you read Angela Davis's book, Woman, Race, and Class, I'm calling this section Woman, Race, and Class in Action. I don't know how many of you knew, know of Lucy Parsons, but she was an American labor organizer and radical socialist, and, and she was an anarcho-communist. Uh, she was the founder, yet again, of the industrial workers uh, of the world, which was quite influential, particularly at that time. So I think it's noteworthy to mention that, yet again, it's another woman that was one of the co-founders of this important and militant uh, labor history and labor movement. Um, so she also co-founded three influential radical unions in 20th century Chicago. Lucy ran a dressmaking shop where she held secret meetings with other Chicago garment workers, and in 1886, they led the city's first May Day parade, uh, which came, which actually led to the eight-hour workday. So, again, a, re a really influential uh, contribution for women. But it wasn't just Lucy who played an important role in labor history during that era. In 1866, a group of newly emancipated Black women working as laundresses in Jackson, Mississippi, formed the state's first labor union by sending a resolution to the mayor informing him that he would henceforth be charging the same rate uh, for their labor. Because at the time, and still today, women weren't paid the same as men. And then two decades later, in Atlanta, 98% of black women, working women in the city were employed as domestic workers. So this yet again shows that, yes, during that second wave feminist uh, movement, a lot of women were talking about the importance of moving away from the household and private sphere and into the public sphere, but racialized women uh, and women within the working class were already in the public sphere, right? And they were already hyper-exploited segments of the working class. Um, and she, they worked long, back-breaking hours uh, and uh, still didn't have the same wages as men. And so by organizing, they grew from 20 members to a 3,000-person union, and they also invited their white uh, 
uh, comrades uh, to also join them in the struggle and, and as a show of interracial solidarity. So at this point, we see this second wave feminism arise. And uh, yet again, uh, you know, the, they broadened the struggle. So it was not just about voting rights. And it wasn't necessarily just about working conditions, but it was also about reproduction rights, for instance. It was also about sexuality. But still, despite that, uh, women, uh, I mean, labor unions played an active role within the second wave feminist movement here in Canada. So throughout the 1970s and 19, till 1990s, the labor movement in Canada became a significant ally in the struggle for women's equality. So in Ontario, Ontario alone, there were a variety of different strike actions that took place with a huge presence of women uh, labor activists involved in these strikes. Um, and I think that the last one, it says during 1978 to, 19, uh, 1978 to 79, INCO minor strike occurred and a group of miners' wives for, formed a wives' support committee, which then sent representatives to march in Toronto. And again, it was on International Women's Day that this event took place. BC, some of the, um, uh, the for example, the Service Office and Retail Workers Union of Canada was actually formed uh, and came out of Vancouver's Working Women's Association. So that entire labor move, uh, union was formed out of a working women's organization that occurred that was in existence at the time. These are just some primary sources that show uh, how the labor movement and how different labor unions were um, talking and, and reporting on women's struggle. So the first image is an International Women's Day flyer produced by the Public Service Alliance of Canada Union that addresses the need to organize around childcare and it included a survey uh, on the ne child care needs of its members. Image number two, the Women's Rights Committee of the British Columbia Federation of Labor, together with the Vancouver Women's Research Center, conducted a survey on sexual harassment in the workplace in 1980. So it's quite sad to see that, you know, despite all the militant actions that were happening in the early 1900s, sexual harassment was still a huge issue. Uh, image number three, this uh, in it, this is from 1984, and it deals with the importance for fighting for equality within the Canadian Union of Postal Workers. I think one of the unions that has a more militant history. Um, image number four, if you go to the, oh yeah, they're over here. Image number four, the special report to QP Convention of 1971, highlighted recommendations by the Royal Commission on the Status of Women. If you go to the next page, there are some more. So image number five, the first one over there, is a 1985 booklet by the National Union of the Provincial Government Employees um, that presents a union perspective on negotiating equality at work for women. Image number six, the Public Service Alliance of Canada pamphlet that provides information on occupational reproduction hazards, discrimination against women, uh, current workers' protection and legislation, union action that was taken, uh, that was taken uh, uh, forward by the union. Image number seven is a 1987 study that was based on a result of survey questionnaires developed by the Women's Rights Committee of the BC Federation of Labor. Image eight is from the Toronto uh, Labor Council uh, Women's Commission that was invite invitation to a 1991 International Women's Day lunch that was themed empowering women where we've been, um, where we're going. And uh, the last one is a report for the National uh, Conference of Women in Trades. So anyways, these primary sources show that, women, uh, that labor was you know, very much involved in uh, the struggle for women. Right? And I think that perspective is often missing when we're even talking about the different waves of feminism that have occurred throughout history. So what were the common themes and, and what were some of the things that women were fighting for through all these uh, movements that I just went over, starting from the late 1800s until now? Well, some of the common themes were sexual harassment, um, uh, the rights to maternity and parental leave, equal pay, uh, reproductive rights, access to abortion, uh, affirmative action and employment equity to make sure that the right person gets the job and that there's not there's no discrimination based on gender and sex, um, and just for better uh, access to childcare and abortion rights and working conditions within the union. So what are the issues that we are fighting for to this day? So firstly, to this day, women working full time in Canada, as many of you should know, 
still makes 76 cents to every dollar a man makes, both because jobs that are dominated by women worker, workers are often devalued. So as a teacher, uh, it's usually historically been a job that's predominantly done by women. And to this day, we're fighting for you know, better pay. We're some of the lowest paid uh, teachers in all of Canada here in BC. Right? And it's probably, I think this pandemic shed light on some of the views people have on teachers. Certified babysitters, right? Forget your health and safety rights. Forget everything. You're here to just babysit our kids because we have nowhere else to put them. And that's, that, it is true. And that, but that's not our fault. That's a lack of access to child care services that this country doesn't grant, for instance. Right? And so, but there's others like child care, uh, service sector workers, so on and so forth. Um, lack of affordable child care and adequate maternity leave. And I think COVID really shed light on that. As a teacher, there are so many parents who are like, I don't really care about health and safety right now because if the schools shut down, then I can't go to work. And it's usually the women who take a leave from their job or quit their jobs still to this day as a result of gender norms and gender roles that still make women take care of children far more than men do in our society. Um, violence against women and lack of sexual education or consent. When I was teaching earlier this year, a lot of my students were like, especially those that were COVID started when they were in grade eight and now they're in grade 11, said, we not once got a sexual education class, not once from grade eight to grade 11, right? And I think COVID also shed light on the increase of domestic violence, which is still an issue uh, that women face. So just to, uh, you know, to highlight some of that, how this manifests itself, 67% of Canadians know a woman who has experienced physical or sexual abuse at some point in their life. Uh, Indigenous women are six times more likely uh, to be killed than non-Indigenous women. 6,000 plus women and children sleep in shelters on any given night because it's not safe at home. 160 women and girls were killed in 2020. That's the latest statistics from this source, which increased from 2019 in Canada. Three women a day are killed by their partners in the United States. Three women a day, right? So yes, we've come a long way, but these the issues that women still face are still prevalent today. The issues that the Russian women were fighting, Kara Zetkin were fighting for, we still have to fight for, right? Why? Because capitalism is still here. Our patriarchal system is still here. It manifests itself differently, but it's still here nonetheless. Um, and it says 26% of all women were murdered by their spouse, had left the relationship at some point, right? So it just goes to show how women are viewed within the relationship as well. And so this just goes like a more modern day perspective of how the labor movement is, uh, is advocating for women's rights. So there are stuff that our labor movement is doing right now. I think that there's so much more that they could be doing. But so for instance, uh, the CLC, the Canadian Labour Congress, said today unions work with community groups, national organizations, and international partners to win a better deal for women and their families, including comprehensive pay equity, a national public child care program, workplace support for victims of domestic violence, and ending the culture of discrimination and harassment. Women and their unions are done waiting and working together for fairness from employers and governments. They've also written statements on missing and murdered Indigenous women and also how migrant workers, particularly women, face even more forms of exploitation because of the intersections between race, class, and gender. So what do we have to do as socialists? Then I'm assuming many of us are leftists of some sort. Maybe some of us are anti-capitalists. Maybe some of us call ourselves communists, others socialists. But I would say that for the most part, we're on the left. So what do we have to do if you... Uh, have a labor, if you work in a place that's unionized, get involved in your labor union. If not, work to unionize your workplace. Um, attempt to join committees, like Kayla said that I, uh, I'm on the social justice committee of your, uh, of your union. In this case, if you're interested in addressing women's issues, the gender equality uh, associations or commissions within your union. And in these spaces, I think it's absolutely important for us to provide a critical analysis because if it's not us, then who, right? So we have to be the ones talking about how the lack of public services like childcare, the lack of adequate maternity leave, uh, the lack of improving your conditions and mitigating harassment, getting rid of harassment at the workplace, this is all a result of capitalism, which has put profit 
above people's needs, right? And then, and then for more so that we can't sometimes just sit down with our manage managers and nicely ask for better conditions. Sometimes we have to do uh, more. We have to be militant. We have to go out on the streets. We have to demand more than just waiting for the managers to accept or uh, what we put in front of them. Because oftentimes they won't. And I'm done with uh, com making compromises. Right? I think most people here are done. I think if we want to make concrete changes, then we have to demand it. And that for that, it takes social unionism as opposed to business unionism. On one side, it says the organizing model. On the other is the service model. And I think the organizing model just emphasizes that we need to get our union active. We need collective action. We can't just base it on labor union leadership to uh, negotiate behind the scenes and make some gains and probably make some losses as well. We need a union that's active. And the only way to activate our union is to become involved with it as anti-capitalists, as a strong uh, leftist voice within the union. Um, and so I think that, again, today, just like in the late 1800s and early 1900s, we need strong labor union uh, women and strong labor unions advocating for these changes in order for them to, uh, in, in order for them to happen. And I'll just finish there. So thank you.